Invest Africa, proudly brought to you by KPMG. And this is Invest Africa. It's been termed Africa's baby boom. The United Nations forecasts that four in every ten people will be African by the end of the century. This means that Africa will soon have the largest workforce in the world. With the growing population and mostly positive economic outlook, investing in Africa's youth is an exciting, if not entirely necessary, prospect. This is what we'll be exploring over the next two episodes. Tonight we are joined by a live audience as well well as a panel of distinguished guests. Joining me in the Johannesburg studio, I have the U.S. Ambassador to South Africa, Patrick Gasport, Nola Mashaba, she's a Mandela Washington Fellow, Tabi Leoka, she's an economist at RENCAP, and Mabuto Mtembu, who's a corporate citizenship and tax manager at KPMG. And in Nairobi, we are joined by Lynette Mwendendile. She's a project manager at EVIC International Holdings, which together with the Kenyan Ministry of Education, Science and Technology are in encouraging youth entrepreneurship in the Africa Tech Challenge. Now, for you at home, please join the conversation by using Twitter and following me at Nozi Pumbanjwa. And of course, you can follow us at CNBC Africa. And don't forget that our hashtag is hashtag invest Africa. Everyone, welcome and thank you so much for making the time to join us. Ambassador, let me put you in the hot seat first. Is the youth bulge that we're currently realizing on the African continent an opportunity or is it a threat to the growth trajectory that we're on? I always believe in, in opportunity. Let me first thank you for having us on in, for this great conversation. Let's unpack the numbers a bit. You talked about the fact that four in 10 uh, people on the planet will be uh, from, from Africa mm. at, 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 by the end of the century, but let's look inside those numbers. Right now, there are 1.2 billion people on this planet between the ages of 15 to 24. Of those 1.2 billion, 200 million are here in Africa. Mm. But of those 200 million, 75 million of them are actively looking for work right now. So that presents crisis and challenge. But when I look at the spirit of people like Lola, when I think about some of the young Africans of the 500 who came to Washington, D.C. for a conversation with our president, I'm excited by their ambition, their dreams, their sense of innovation. And, and I'm con confident that that uh, boom mm. is going to uh, uh, redound to the benefit of all mm. Africans. Mabuta, I want you to pick <coughs> up on that. The ambassador talks about a potential <coughs> crisis, particularly when we look at the youth unemployment rate, not only in South Africa, but across the continent. What's driving uh, the structural and unemployment across the continent? Yeah, I mean, you would appreciate that, you know, Africa in the past, you know, uh, faced quite a number of challenges. And uh, I think the reality is that uh, with the rapid growth of young people in the continent, the reality is that we need to focus on, for instance, education. Now, for instance, if we're going to have young people who are uneducated and who do not have exposure to opportunities that exist, then we're going to have a crisis in the future because you will uh, sort of experience economic growth in the continent, but the people of the continent, the young people, will not actually have an opportunity to participate actively mm. in that economy. So that is a critical component that we need to focus on. Uh, and, and the most important one is leadership, and the most important one is also education. Mm. So there needs to be a, a, a substantial investment by both the government, the civil society, yeah. the private sector, and so forth, to invest in education so that with the, the economic growth that Africa is currently experiencing, the young people of this continent then have a meaningful role to play in that economy. Mabuta, I'm going to play devil's advocate, and I'm going to come back to this uh, question of education and maybe interrogate a little bit further. But before we do that, let's go to Nairobi. Uh, Lynette, I, I want us to talk about uh, the appropriate policy responses. You're working with the Kenyan government. Are you getting the sense that African governments, from a policy perspective, are responding effectively when it comes to integrating young people in the mainstream economy? I agree that right now the Ministry of Education has been trying to really integrate the young people in the economy because we see that they are revising the education curriculum to suit the young people. What we need to do is basically invest in the education that we are giving to the young people. And I believe that the Ministry of Education is putting in place the right measures to basically invest in education. 
right now Africa is growing and for us to get to the right economic growth we really need to invest in the right kind of education and for me I believe once we get the education we are able to impart the right technical skills to the young people and as a result we can be able to revolutionize the economic growth of Africa and I believe the Ministry of Education in Kenya is taking the necessary steps in doing that. Nola I'm hearing education from Nairobi I'm hearing education from Johannesburg but I'm putting it to you that African governments actually spend a higher percentage of their fiscal budget on education than many other developing economies or developing or, or developed markets let me put it like that and yet the return on investment is not actually coming through where are we getting it wrong because clearly it's not about uh, political will that's there and it, clearly it's not about the money and yet we're still falling behind what are we getting wrong thank you nosy from my opinion and what I have um observed in the market is that yes there is quite a number a lot of budget that is being invested into education but what type of education are we actually putting in place what type of teachers are we putting in the schools that they, our children have to go into because just the other day I, I, I went into a cab and I was speaking, talking to the driver, only to find that he's a young man, he's under 30, he has his own car that he's using, he's being entrepreneurial, he's using his own car to, for, for a taxi service and he's making money out of it. And I realized that he's actually smart. So what stopped you from feathering your education? And he said that I really did want to go to school, but I couldn't afford 40,000 rand uh, per annum. But for someone who is as smart as he is, mm. and when you are at school and you have access to the type of information that you need in terms of where you want, what you want to study, where you need to study, and what type of um, bursaries and scholarships are in place because they are all in there. What are the teachers mm. doing at school that we have a smart man like this who's not able to know that actually there are bursaries that I can apply and I don't necessarily mm. have to uh, pay for it myself. Tabi, the, the, the story that Nola tells us I think is very reflective of the problem that we have in South Africa. We have an increasing number of graduates so young people are getting educated and yet they're still not participating in the economy. How do we break those barriers? Um, if it's not education what else should we be doing? I think South Africa is an interesting country in that we have per capita the biggest budget in the world. Um, we have a slightly, so a little bit above um, one trillion uh, rand budget. About 200, 000, 200 billion goes into education alone. Mm. And if you look at South Africa versus the rest of Africa, we're lagging behind in terms of uh, the type of education yeah. and the type of students we have uh, coming out of our schools. And that just says to me, look, if you look at other countries, um, the UK and the US, uh, they invested uh, in research and development. The, U the reason how the US actually surpassed the UK in development is because of uh, this huge uh, investment in research and development. So we are doing that, but I think importantly we need to ask ourselves as you know, Africans, what type of economies do we want to be? Mm. So we can't just have people go to school and not be absorbed into the workplace. The, you know, it, there obviously is um, a misalignment uh, problem uh, that a s person who studies you know, sociology cannot be absorbed into the workplace. Mm. So that just simply tells me that maybe certain, um, you know, s s certain subjects are not appropriate maybe. And we need to first ask ourselves, what kind of economies do we want to be? And what kind of resources do we need? And what type of graduates do we mm. need? Are we a manufacturing country? Then we should um, follow the, the South Korea route and try to push uh, science, maths, mm. technology. And remember that a lot of our countries are coming out into, you know, from civil war into a different world, a world that is very technologically advanced and we need to almost play a, a catch up mm. and, and we need to invest in, 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 in technology. Let me interject on that point and maybe Ambassador allow you to come in because Tabi now raises the issue of the technological revolution that we're seeing on the continent. And here we are also saying we've got a, a growing population of young people. Is this the answer? Do we upskill young people so that they can be the driving force behind that revolution? 
Well, I think that the answer to that is in the affirmative. It's, a, it's yes with an exclamation point. But I, I want to just caution us for one second, if I can. I think that a lot of the uh, points that have been made about where things stand in education outcomes in South Africa, while they're absolutely true and correct, I, I do want to remind us that we are talking about um, systems that have been in place for, uh, for two decades. And there have been a number of changes made in curriculum uh, over the course of that time. Uh, and I know that um, as I go around the country, I talk to uh, young people, I talk to uh, individuals in, in your ministries, it seems as if uh, there's a, a lot of um, experimentation that's taking place. And we've seen some uh, positive uh, improvements. I, I will say that um, one of the most exciting things that's happening uh, in South Africa uh, is the uh, investment in uh, new energy uh, innovations and new energy uh, technology. And I think that's a space that young people ought to be properly motivated mm. around and trained for so they can really inhabit it in a in an ownership uh, way. Uh, Mabuto, I, I want to maybe bring in the role of the private sector in driving the education agenda. As the amb ambassador says, there's lots of experimentation. We've seen in South Africa with the establishment of uh, the, the Education Trust, which is headed by RMB amongst other business leaders. Is that perhaps another option that we should be focusing on a little bit more aggressively, bringing the private sector a little bit closer to government and maybe solving some of the issues that Tabi raises about that misalignment that we have? Certainly, certainly. I think in terms of the approach, I think we need to take a holistic approach and multidisciplinary approach. And in that way, we should not only be looking at the government in terms of the capital injection that they are putting in education, but for me, the role of the private sector is very critical. Because if, for instance, you look at the country like South Africa, now you've got kids that go to schools in the rural areas which are not, and they do not get exposure to, you know, what the economy offers and the kind of opportunities that are there in the economy. So that's when you will need the private sector to actually come on board to actually get to those places, including the professionals that are working in the private sector, to coach these people on careers, to mentor these people because they lack motivation. They are despondent and they do not have the role models to look up to. So mm. it is quite critical that that approach is taken by the private sector to go and invest in the communities. And for me, it would mainly be on the downstream education. Mm. So to mentor and coach the youngsters that are in the communities, especially from the disadvantaged backgrounds. And for instance, I also chair an organization called Youth Managers Foundation. It is doing exactly the same thing in partnership with KPMG Foundation, mm. which is to take the KPMG professionals to the rural schools and coach and mentor young people because so that they get exposure to other opportunities mm. that could be offered in the economy. Let me take the final question uh, to Nairobi. Um, Lynette, let's, let's maybe talk a little bit about a political focus. How do we ensure that we don't have a replication of the Arab Spring in many of our African markets? And, and in, particularly, in particular, how do we keep young people engaged so that their productivity is actually positively reinforcing as against a destabilizing factor? I believe that we need to bring about initiatives in terms of youth forums. We need to create awareness all around Kenya, all around Africa to the youth. We need to let them get engaged because one of the big problems we are all facing is the huge unemployment gap and it's really you know, targeting the youth. So if we were to bring about initiatives that can be able to make the youth be involved, we need to empower them through youth empowerment platforms and definitely the government needs to put in more initiatives that are going to target the youth in terms of, for example, in Kenya, we have the AGPO, which is the access to government procurement opportunities. And the youth right now are able to access 30% of all government tenders and contracts. But you might find that the youth are not aware. They don't even know that there are some specific things that are out there for them to benefit. So we need the government to really create awareness and target the youth in terms of bringing them together. As we are talking about the private sector, we need the private sector also to invest in the rural areas, to bring around the youth who are not uneducated, who are uneducated in Africa who are also in the rural areas, we need to find a way to combat them and bring them together such that the youth are able now to be benefiting from all these initiatives 
and also we need also to bring about a lot of technical skills imparting. Mm. You know, right now the youth, as you're saying, we have so many degrees and there are still no jobs for the youth. What we can do is focus on vocational training. We can train the youth in able to impart the basic skill such that they can be absorbed by the local industries, they can be absorbed by the private sector, and in return, the youth can be very economically mm. enabled. So many degrees and so few jobs. It's time for a quick break, but when we come back, more from our panel and audience on investing in Africa's youth. Don't go away. Welcome back. You're still watching Invest Africa. We're talking about the youth dividend on the African continent, and we're just about to go to our live audience. For you at home, if you want to be part of this conversation, you can follow me at Nozi Pumbandra or at CNBC Africa. And don't forget to use our show's hashtag, which is hashtag Invest Africa. Let's take our first question. Yes, my name is Rapalang Mutsumi. I just want to direct my question to Tabi that since we have acknowledged that um, the investment have not really materialized the results uh, that we have put into education. So is it not probably because we have focused much more on the access to education rather than the quality? And how can we rather build you know, a commensurate development between the quality and access? So question of access and quality, let's take our second question. Hi, my name is Prashant Baga and um, my question, oh, I'm from uh, an online marketing company, and this ties in. Um, my question comes in with the importance of education. I studied to be an architect, yet uh, after running the architecture company for a while, I turned to an online marketing company because I found my passion. Now, that's completely detached, but it's how can we in South Africa use the knowledge that we have combined with entrepreneurship and basically give back to the country? Thank you very much. Uh, knowledge and entrepreneurship. Let's take a final question before we go to the panel. Do we have a question from here? Please. Hi, my, my name is Mtutuzu Godlo. Uh, my question is directed to the ambassador. I think uh, in taking advantage of the big youth bulge in South Africa, comparing that to the US that have done really well with the, taking young people and making them dollar billionaires, what practical things can we do in South Africa in order to raise a new generation of young entrepreneurs in the same level as US? Dollar billionaires, and that's the question. Well, maybe Nola, uh, no, Tabi, the first question was uh, directed at you. Let's get you picking up on that question. I think we do have a, a problem with access. Um, I, I, you know, if you look at, again, I'll look at other regions and see how South Africa can actually benefit and learn from other regions. I think for starters, we need to look at, um, seriously look at free education. Um, if you look at, uh, let's say Latin America. I've traveled quite a bit in Latin America and I've wondered what makes the kids in Latin America, any country in Latin America, so different to the South African kids, even when they come from you know, a poor background or low income. And the difference there is education is an equalizer. So the kids who have access to education and education all the way from primary to university is free. So when you have that, uh, their fate is not determined by their social background or their, their, you know, their economic background. And this allows a child from Peru or from Brazil, Colombia, to become a doctor, a lawyer, or professional. And I think the difference in South Africa is that we don't have that access. So we don't have free education. And when it is free, it is not of good quality always. And um, you tend to have the more Model C or the private school learners um, having a, you know, better access, better education, and having um, uh, being absorbed by business uh, faster than those who started off um, uh, disadvantaged. Mm. And I think that is something that we need to close as South Africa. I think that's where the investment should be. And also going back to identifying the skills that we need for um, industry, for corporate South Africa. Uh, I get several uh, CVs and it's very hard to now try to match these CVs to what's happening in South Africa, um, you know, where we're trying mm. to take the economy. And I did mention earlier that we really need to identify the types of economies we are so that we can, from a very young age, try to yeah. channel or direct 
the youth into a certain path so that they can be absorbed and also competitive on a global scale and also on an mm. African scale. A conscious positioning, this is what I'm hearing from you about young people and aligning them with the needs of the economy. Maybe Mabut and Nola, let's pick up the question that was raised about the, uh, the convergence of entrepreneurship and knowledge. Nola? Okay. Um, how do you balance the two? what you have learned at school and what you know about entrepreneurship and obviously the benefits of, of the two. One is that education is very key because it gives you the type of thinking, the strategic thinking that you need to be able to run your business. During uh, my fellowship in the US right now, I learned a lot about business that I wouldn't have been aware of, that I can come back here, back at home, and actually apply it within my working environment. But what entrepreneurship does, it allows you to think beyond what you have learned. It allows you to think creatively, it allows you to think innovatively, so that when you are able to be in that space and you're thinking beyond and outside your box, you have the <coughs> knowledge that you have learned from school to be able to structure it uh, properly. And I'm one person who advocates entrepreneurship from a school level. We need, our education system needs to start thinking of entrepreneurship yeah. as a viable career option because it's too late if you're starting in your 20s. Mm. But if you're managing your um, culturally education that you actually get at school and then you're combining that with entrepreneurship very early on yeah. you're able to grow into something a bit more tangible than okay fine I used to be a doctor but now this is what I want to do and that could be completely different. So Nola is advocating that we not only think out of the box maybe we just get rid of the box altogether and we have a, a clearer convergence uh, at an earlier stage. Your view on that Mabuta? My, my view of, on that is twofold. And the first one is that if we are going to introduce entrepreneurship as a subject at schools, uh, it may not uh, achieve the intended results. And, the, and, and, and that is basis, based on the fact that I've, I, I do visit schools on a regular basis. And if you look, for instance, the organization that I, I talked about earlier, it focuses on mentorship and leadership development. And the question always arises as to but there is a, li a subject called life orientation. And the students would say, life or orientation is, is theory. So we do not get to practice what we learn in theory. Now, when you get professionals coming to schools and mentoring us and coaching us, then that is more practice and talking about leadership and then giving us responsibilities to lead. So that is more practical. Mm. So my challenge to you is that Instead of introducing a subject called entrepreneurship, yes, we can do that as a policy, but we need to supplement it with the kind of entrepreneurs that we already have, 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 have emerged in the economy to go back to the schools and, and as part of active citizenship and then invest in coaching those great ideas or mm. those great potential entrepreneurs that may exist at that level. Mm. So at least that, that they will impart their knowledge and their skills and what they have learned through their journey into entrepreneurship, but that becomes more practical. And the kids that can then engage on a more practical basis, yeah. and in that regard, I believe we would then be able to sort of develop more and more entrepreneurs. Mm. No doubt, Ambassador, you would have views on, on, on the earlier uh, uh, you know, views that have just been shared but the question that came from the floor is how do we get more young dollar billionaires and I think we're all listening quite attentively to that one. <laughs> well uh, I'm going to try to uh, respond to all of this as, as I respond to that question but I won't use your frame of dollar billionaires. <laughs> so we, 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 um, uh, I appreciate what you said about the United States but let's uh, also recognize that we all have our challenges as you look at what's taking place in places like Ferguson, St. Louis right now, you realize that there are young people in our country who are starved uh, for opportunity and for equal access. As President Obama uh, said when he spoke to our Yali fellows, we can't guarantee uh, equality of outcome, but we can guarantee equality of opportunity. I don't want to lose the thread of what you said earlier about the need for um, uh, free education, and I don't want to lose what you said about uh, rural zones. One of the great struggles that you have here in South Africa is the, d the physical uh, dislocation that continues to persist as a result of the apartheid uh, regime. There are, there are vast challenges in infrastructure in rural parts of this country. Some of those challenges are gendered because we know that young women in particular are denied access and denied opportunity. And you're really not going to get to uh, a space where you can really effectively challenge that 25% mm. unemployment unless you're dealing with those infrastructure issues 
issues, which are addressed to a certain extent in your national development plan. Now, in regards to what uh, you can be doing to encourage a different kind of environment for young people here, you have to encourage risk taking. One of the things that uh, we learned very early on in the United States is if you're going to be successful, you have to dare to fail at some point or, or another. Nothing is guaranteed. There is a, a vast uh, social safety net, but the expectation is that you're gonna go out there, you're gonna stake a claim, and you're gonna be okay with failing because you really learned the most uh, through failure. We've talked a lot about entrepreneurship. I know that's the focus of, of folks who are here today, but let's also uh, remember, going back to your point about strategic decisions being made about what kind of economy you want, entrepreneurship is not what is going to grow the vast majority of jobs for young people in this country and really t tackle these really uh, challenging uh, unemployment metrics. Mm. At the end of the day, you have to figure out if you're going to have an industrial economy, you have to figure out how you're going to open markets, and that's really ultimately what's going to create lots and lots of opportunity for the vast majority of South Africans. Well, the takeaway for me is that we need to create a culture of <coughs> risk-taking where young people are dared to fail, and in the very least, they at least have tried. That's all we have time for for tonight. Please don't forget to send us your comments. Uh, the details are on the screen. Join us next week for part two of this discussion. But for now, Bruce Whitfield is standing by to bring you tonight with Bruce. From myself and the Invest Africa team, it's goodbye.